Well, we're continuing looking at uh, using correct terminology uh, in the scripture. And we've already covered two terms that would be Christian and church over the last two Sundays. This Sunday, I'm going to step it up a notch. We're going to cover seven terms, Lord willing. And some of these terms, most of them are going to have to do with salvation. As a matter of fact, I think all of them do. And uh, some of the terms coming yet in the future will also have to do with salvation because the Bible has a lot to say about that. And it is important to use correct terminology when it comes to salvation because a lot of people get things confused unintentionally and uh, they don't recognize the phases of salvation and they start talking about when they were saved and they may be referring to their conversion, they may be referring to their regeneration, they may be referring to uh, their justification. All of those things happen at different times and uh, we will look at that as we go through this study. So the first term that I want to look at is sovereign grace and that term is actually not found in the Bible. Now the term uh, grace is found in the Bible, but the phrase sovereign grace is not. But it does describe a biblical doctrine, that is the doctrine of salvation by grace. And just because a, a phrase is not used in the Bible does not mean that we're forbidden to use the phrase. Uh, for instance, the word trinity is not found in the Bible. We use the word trinity, and there's nothing wrong with that. It describes the nature of the triune God, that he's three persons, or three, yeah, three persons and one God. Um, so nothing wrong necessarily with using terms that aren't in the Bible, as long as we are using them to describe truthful biblical doctrines and using them accurately. So sovereign grace is the act of God in saving his elect by his grace alone, apart from their will or works. If I had to just summarize it in a sentence. And I'll give you a couple of few verses here which will establish this. Uh, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 9. And I will get into why I use the term sovereign grace as opposed to just grace. Because I could, and I, I will show you, based on the definition of the word grace, I could just use the word grace in place of sovereign grace. Because grace is sovereign grace. But I'll explain to you why I typically use the term sovereign grace instead of just grace. And it's got nothing to do with um, the Bible. It has to do with people that misunderstand my words. If I use the word grace, people are going to hear something totally different because they don't understand what the Bible means when it uses the word grace. So I'll get into that here in a little bit, though. Uh, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 9. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 9 so this is speaking of God who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So here is the grace of God described in how God saves a sinner, and it has nothing to do with the sinner's works, not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace. So clearly here, God is the one that is doing the saving. God is saving by grace, and it is all of him. Because if it's not of works, that means that you had nothing to do with it. So that verse is declaring the doctrine of sovereign grace. Likewise, Titus 3, 5 through 7, declares the same doctrine. Titus 3, 5 through 7. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Now, in 2 Timothy 1.9, it said, not of works. Well, that would be any kind of works. This one specifies that not even works of righteousness, not even the good works that you do are going to affect or could affect your eternal salvation. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, I'll get to regeneration, Lord willing, in a future study, right? I want to make sure I don't have it. No, it will be coming up in the next week or two, Lord willing. So I'll save that for that, for that time. So salvation here is not by works of righteousness. It's not according to our works. It's according to God's mercy. And mercy is favor that is showed towards somebody that is not deserving of it. It's kind and compassionate treatment when severity is merited 
or expected. That's what mercy is. So if God saves you by mercy, that means that salvation is all of him because he didn't have to save you. He didn't have to show compassion on you. He did because he chose to, and he didn't do so because of any good thing you did. See, this verse is teaching sovereign grace, which he shed on us, verse 6, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Grace, God's salvation by grace, is the means by which we get eternal life. And that will be coming up uh, in this uh, same sermon in a little bit as well. So we see here, this whole process here, which is described in verses 5 through 7, is describing sovereign grace. I will define sovereign here for you in just a minute, but let me give you one more verse. And that is Romans 9 and verse 16. Romans 9 and verse 16. It says, So then it, and this is referring to God's election, which we'll look at here later in the study today. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. God's election and choice is not of the sinner's will or the sinner's works. Anything that the sinner does or thinks has nothing to do with God's election and his grace. Now, we use the word, I use the word, I think you probably, some of you do too, use the term sovereign grace because God is a sovereign king and God chooses to whom he will extend mercy and grace just like a king does. A king does whatever he wants and a king also does what he wants when it comes to extending mercy. Kings, in the days when kings were real kings, the king chose, when he executed, or when he determined judgment, he chose who lived and who died. Um, That's just the way it was in those days. And it's the same way with God. Uh, Turn with me to Daniel 4 and verse 35. A lot of people have conceived a, a God in their own minds that is... You know, kind of like their servant, he just does whatever they want and they pray and he answers and, you know, he, he's basically at their beck and call and if they want to be saved, if they want to go to heaven, all they do is just say, hey, I'd like to go to heaven. And he says, okay, I'll do that for you, sure. I mean, they pretty much, you know, hey, I want a, I want a new house. Oh, okay, I'll do that for you. Oh, I want, a, I want a better job. I'll do that for you. That's how a lot of people view God. He's just there at their beck and call and he pretty much does whatever they want. Um, he just responds and um, and if... If, if they're obstinate enough and, and after he begs and pleads with them for a whole lifetime to try to save them, if they just won't comply, then he, he begrudgingly does send them to hell in some people's mind. In some people's mind, he just saves everybody anyway. But, you know, he, he really gives it, a, gives it the old college try, and if the person won't comply, then he'll eventually judge them. That's kind of most people's idea of God. You know, pretty much he's just out there to, to do whatever you want him to. Uh, but that's not what the Bible teaches about God. Uh, Daniel 4 in verse 35, this is, these words were spoken by King Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of the Babylonian Empire, and he had been previously sent out into a field to crawl around out there for a while and eat grass like an ox and let his, let his, uh, his hair grow out like bird's feathers and his fingernails grow out like bird's claws till seven times over. Now, I don't know if that means seven years or seven, seven periods of something anyway, but long enough that his hair got quite long and his fingernails got quite long. So he was out there for a long time. He was out there until he figured out that God's in control, that God is sovereign and that he wasn't. Verse 35, this is what Nebuchadnezzar <laughs> finally figured out. He said, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? He's talking about God, Jehovah. God does according to his will. He's the one that's in charge. He calls the shots. He makes the decisions. He does what he wants to do. Not what you want him to do, but what he wants to do. Now, if what you ask him to do is in accordance with his will, then he'll do it. But if it's just your will and your idea and something you want, well, then don't count on that. The inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing before God. 
All, all of the mighty men and the kings of this earth and the powerful people and the rich people, they're all reputed as nothing. It says in, in Isaiah 40 that there is a, as, as a, a drop in the bucket. Right? They're just nothing. They're, it says in another place they are less than nothing. All the inhabitants of the earth. That's what God thinks of all of us who think so highly of ourselves. He thinks that of us. He does what he wants. He is the blessed and only potentate. Look at uh, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 15. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 15. And this is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is Jehovah, who is God manifest in the flesh. And it says in 1 Timothy 6.15, which in his times he shall show, which means that he's going to be seen, he's going to be visible, he's going to appear, he's going to become visible and make an appearance. He's coming back, in other words, which in his time he shall show. That's what we're waiting for. Who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Jesus Christ is the blessed and only potentate. I don't have the definition here, but from memory, a potentate is one that is endowed with independent power, a king or a monarch. Jesus Christ is the king of the universe, and he does according to his will. And he's also sovereign in salvation. Now, there are a lot of people, there are a lot of fundamental independent Baptist churches out there that everything that I said up until this point, well, except for the salvation stuff, they would agree with, oh yeah, God's in control. God's the king. God calls the shots. God, God, God does whatever he wants to, except when it comes to saving a sinner. And then all of a sudden, God steps back and says, whoa, whoa, whoa I can't interfere with human will here. I mean, Right, I, I can spin up the universe if I want to, and I can cast mountains into the sea. I can destroy this earth. I can melt it down with fervent heat. I can do anything I want. But when it comes to resisting human will, overpowering human will, pff, can't do that. That's what they think. But God is sovereign even when it comes to salvation. I shouldn't say even. I mean, that's like the biggest thing that he's sovereign over is when it comes to salvation, the most important thing. Uh, Romans 9 and verse 15. I don't get my theology from songs at all, but there is an old Johnny Cash song, one of, one of his last songs, and he says there's a man coming around taking names, and he decides who to free and who to blame. Everybody won't be treated all the same. That song is very doctrinally sound, as a matter of fact. Just gives me chills up my spine whenever I hear it. Romans 9 and verse 15. It says, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. He doesn't say, I will have mercy on whoever demands it from me, or whoever asks for it. He says, I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I'm the one that chooses. I have mercy on some, God says. I don't have mercy on others. Because I am a sovereign, God says. And that's what a sovereign does. And when you're dealing with a bunch of sinners, none of them deserve mercy. So it's not like we can say, well, that's not fair. Why would God have mercy on some and not others? If you want to get into fairness, the question would be, why would he have mercy on any because the fair thing to do would be to judge them and give them what they deserve. That's what's fair. The fact that God has mercy on anybody shows that he doesn't, you know, in that sense, I guess you could say he's not being fair. He's not giving us what we deserve. He gave what we deserve to Jesus Christ and he made him suffer in our stead. That doesn't sound very fair to me, but I thank God he's not fair. Thank God he's not fair in that sense anyway. Now he's sovereign. Sovereign, let's first of all get the adjective. Sovereign is, when we're speaking of persons, standing out above others or excelling in some respect. When we're talking about things or qualities, it is supreme, paramount, principal, greatest, or most noble. And a sovereign, like the noun, is one who has supremacy or rank above or authority over others. A superior, a ruler, 
governor, lord, or master of persons, etc. It's frequently applied to the deity in relation to created things. So this is God, the superior, the ruler, the governor, the lord, the master, the one that's in charge, the one that calls the shots. And he does so concerning salvation. Now, that word there, that phrase, sovereign grace, we've already looked at sovereign, let's look at grace. Grace is unmerited favor and is not in any way dependent on human faith or other works. I'm just going to give you two verses here, put these together, and we're going to see that works, whether they are physical things that we do, like giving to the poor or helping somebody out or taking communion or getting baptized or whether they are mental works like faith and belief. Either kind of works do not have any, um, do, do not have any effect on grace. Romans 11, 5 through 6. Romans 11, 5 through 6. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. See, election and grace go hand in hand. That's why the doctrine of election, the, the action of election is called the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So that verse there, number six, shows us that you can't mix grace and works together. That's a common view. That, and as a matter of fact, that's what most of the professing Christian world does is they mix grace and works together. Whether it's faith, whether it's praying some prayer, whether it's walking down the aisle, whether it's being baptized, what, you know, any number of, of things you have to do, they mix that with the grace of God. And they say that when you do these things, then God saves you by his grace. So it's kind of like grace is conditional in their mind. But I'll read you the definition of the word, and we're going to see that grace is not conditional. But this verse just shows us that. You can't mix grace and works. If you have any work added into the equation, it's all work. And if you have grace, you can't have any work. Grace is favor. It's favor, favorable, or benignant regard or its manifestation, now only on the part of a superior favor or goodwill in contradistinction to right or obligation as the ground of a concession. Most people's idea of grace, as I said, is that God says, you do this, that, or the other thing, and then I save you by grace. That's, that's generally how most people present the gospel. You, you preach the gospel and you say, you have to do X, Y, and Z. Maybe that's believe the gospel. Maybe it's pray the sinner's prayer. Maybe it's accept Jesus into your heart. It's you got to do something and you do this and God will save you by his grace. That's what most people teach. That's, that's what the majority of the professing Christian world teaches. And yet the very word grace means that it is favor or goodwill in contradistinction to right or obligation. Under that system that I just described, if you if the Arminian preachers right. And you say, okay, you tell me that I have to accept Jesus as my personal Savior and God saves me by His grace. Okay, Jesus, I accept you as my personal Savior. What must come next? What is Jesus Christ obliged to do now? Save you by His grace, right? That's the deal. You accept Jesus as your personal Savior. God saves you by His grace. If you complete the first step, God has to do the second one according to that system, right? God couldn't just say, well, no, I'm not going to save you because I don't feel like it. Well, he can't, right? He has to save you if you accept Jesus as your personal Savior or if you pray the sinner's prayer or if whatever, whatever you have to do, right? That's not grace. That is an obligation on God's behalf. He has to do it. And if you have to show mercy to somebody, it's not called grace. It's called duty. For by duty are ye saved, right? Is that what the Bible says? No. For by obligation on God's behalf are you saved? No, of course not. By grace you're saved. Now the word grace by itself conveys the idea that God alone decides whom he bestows favor towards. Just the, the definition, the word, that's what it means. 
right? That God is the one that decides because it is in contradistinction to right or obligation. It is favor shown towards somebody that is not in a position to receive it, to, to have any claim on it. Now, since most people think grace is an offer of salvation, which is contingent upon faith, which it is not, we must use, or I use, uh, the term sovereign grace to describe our belief concerning eternal salvation to clear up any confusion. I'm going to get back to that point because I forgot the previous verse. Okay, I had a verse that I was going to, I was going to talk about faith being a work, and I forgot all about it. So just hold that thought. We'll get there in a second. Turn with me back to John 6, 28 through 29. John 6, 28 through 29. Now, most people will tell you, and they will agree, salvation is not of works. Your works, what you do, has nothing to do with your salvation. Pretty much every Arminian under the sun will tell you that. Almost every professing Christian, there are some exceptions. Some people actually do straight up tell you that God saves you by works. They really do. I mean, they actually teach that. They, they really say that. I've met people like that. Um, and I don't know how they get around all the verses in the Bible that say it's not of works. But anyway, but most people would agree salvation is not of works. But they'll say faith is not a work. See, that's different. Faith is not a work. Faith is faith, right? Works are something you do. Faith isn't something you do, right? Well, let's see what Jesus had to say about that. We've heard what the Arminians, the preachers and soul winners and all that, hear what they had to say about it. Let's see what Jesus had to say about it. John six twenty eight through 29. Then said they unto him, this is Jesus' disciples speaking to him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. They said, what must we do to work the works of God? Now, work, by definition, is something that a man does or did. Right? Work is something you do. That, that is what work is by primary definition. Okay? What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus said, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. You want to do the works of God? You want to work works of God? Here's what you do. Believe on him whom he has sent. That is the work of God. That's the work that God wants you to do, is to believe on Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And it's a work. You say, well, I don't think faith was a work. Have you ever tried to do it before? You ever try to have faith? You ever try to believe, even when everything within you is telling you that you don't want to believe? I don't want to believe what this says. I have a really hard time believing what this says. I doubt what this says. Belief is a work. It's work to believe. It's hard to believe sometimes. Why do you think the disciple said, Lord, the man said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. He's saying, I believe, but this is hard work. Help me to keep believing. The, the apostle said, Lord, increase our faith. If it wasn't work, why would they have to ask him to increase it? Why wouldn't they just have all that they need? Because it's hard work to believe. You don't get to heaven by your hard work, including your hard work of belief. You don't get to heaven by that. You get to heaven by God's grace alone. God in mercy saves you by his grace, not according to any of your works. And all of your works, including your faith, are evidence of salvation. Not the cause of salvation. That's where everybody gets all mixed up. Your works, including your faith, are evidence, not cause. I'll get to some verses which will prove that later on in this sermon. Okay, so getting back to the other point. Since most people think that grace is an offer of salvation which is contingent upon faith, which it's not, but they think that, I use the term sovereign grace to describe our belief concerning eternal salvation, and that clears up confusion, or at least it helps to prevent confusion. I should say that. I could just say grace. Because if I say, I believe in salvation by grace, our church believes in grace, grace means sovereign grace. But you know what happens when I say our church believes in grace? You know what, what any professing Christian I'm talking to is going to think? Well, so does ours. Of course. Yeah, our church believes in grace too. Well, we, we're, all, we're all the same. No, we're not. Because they say they believe in grace, but they don't really believe in grace. They believe in grace plus your faith, plus your works, plus your whatever, plus something. And grace plus something is works. 
whatever you add to it. So what they really believe in is salvation by works. We really actually believe in salvation by grace. We believe that Jesus Christ actually purged sins by himself. We believe that Jesus actually gave his sheep eternal life and they shall never perish. We believe that Jesus actually did it. When he said it's finished, we believe that it was actually finished. He actually saved all the Father gave him to save. Most people don't believe that. They just believe that it was started at that point. And it's up to you to complete the transaction. This would be the same reason why I don't just use the word church to describe our church. Because, you know, in the Bible, as we looked at here last Sunday, in the Bible, churches were only called churches. Right? There was no denomination. There were no adjectives to add to the, you know. It was just a church. What is your religion? I go to a church. I am a member of a church, right? Well, if today somebody said, uh, what kind of a church are you a member of? And I said, oh, I'm a member of a church. They'd be like, oh, yeah, but what kind? Oh, a church. I mean, you can't say that because there's like 40,000 denominations out there, right? So you have to use some kind of a descriptor to describe what kind of a church you go to today since there are so many of them out there. So that's why I've got like 14 adjectives that I throw in the front of it. So I try to help people understand. Well, I'm a member of an historic, independent, unincorporated, non-501c3. There's another one in there. KJV only, Sovereign Grace Baptist Church. There you go. So I put a few adjectives on there to try to give somebody a brief idea of what it is that our church believes. You could say, well, I go to a real church. That's going to win you a lot of friends, number one. And number two, that really doesn't help people if they don't understand what one is. Or you say, I go to a true church. Once again, you know, I use that term when I'm, when I'm talking to people that are searching for a true church. But if I'm just talking to the average Joe, right, if I say, oh, I go to a true church, they're going to say, you're an arrogant, pompous, you know what, right? That, that's probably not, not the best way to go about it. And I also don't use the word Calvinism to refer to sovereign grace. Um, And I will get into that later on in this study. Um, I don't use Calvinism because there are two points of Calvinism that are erroneous. The the last two points, as they um, understand them anyway, are um, erroneous. So uh, that's why I don't use that term either. But I, I intend to get into that later on in this study. So I'll save that. All right, the next term is the term election or elect. I'll give you the definition first of all. Election is the formal choosing of a person for an office, dignity, or position of any kind, usually by the votes of a constituent body. That's not exactly how God's election worked out. I don't think the Trinity took a vote on who they were going to pick you know, to be God's people. But anyway, I'm just giving you the primary definition. Uh, the, uh, number two, the exercise of deliberate choice or preference, choice between alternatives, especially in matters of conduct. And then theologically, and this is how, of course, we're using it. It's the exercise of God's sovereign will in choosing some of his creatures in preference to others for blessings, temporal or spiritual, especially for eternal salvation. The doctrine of election, that phrase, is the doctrine that God actually exercises this prerogative with regard to mankind in popular language, often identified with the Calvinistic doctrine of unconditional election, i.e. election not conditioned by the conduct or disposition of the individual. So when we're talking about election, we're talking about God's sovereign will in choosing to save some of his creatures as opposed to others. Election is God's choosing of men to eternal salvation. Let me give you a few verses in the Bible which will establish this. Uh, Ephesians 1 and verse 4, first of all. Now, this verse does not contain the word election, but we just gave, I just gave you the definition of election, so you'll see that a synonym of election is used in this verse. Ephesians 1 and verse 4. According as he, that is God, hath chosen us in him, that is Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. 
That's another word for election or elect, right? God elected us before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame, which tells you that we were not holy when he chose us. He didn't look down and find the good ones, find the ones that believed in him or accepted him or something like that and chose them. No, he chose us that we should be holy, not because we already were. Right, so they always want to remember that because somebody will throw that one at you. One of these days, I guarantee you, you tell somebody you believe in the doctrine of election and you give them Ephesians 1, 4, and if they know anything, they're going to say, oh, well, that was talking about the people that were, that, that God looked ahead and he saw that they were in Christ. They chose to put themselves in Christ and therefore he chose them because they were in Christ. No, he chose to put them in Christ to make them holy, not because they already were holy. So you want to keep that one in the back of your mind. Uh, Romans 11 and verse 5, which we already looked at. Romans 11 and verse 5 says, Even so then, at this present time, there's also a remnant according to the election of grace. Election of grace. That's Remember what grace is. That's how God saved us from our sins. So here we have election being God choosing men to eternal salvation. And let me give you one more in 1 Peter 1. And verse 2. First Peter 1 and verse 2. Elect. So there's our word. Elect. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. That's why I say election is God choosing men to eternal salvation because what does the verse say that we're elected to? We are elect unto the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ in that verse. God chose us to be sprinkled by Christ's blood. God's, in other words, God chose us to be saved, purged from our sins eternally. Election is not man's choosing of God for eternal salvation. Uh, let's just make this clear of who does the choosing for eternal salvation. Romans chapter 9 and verse 11. Election is choosing, and a lot of people are okay with that. Oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah, my, my religion teaches choice for salvation, too. My choice for salvation. See, our religion teaches God's choice for salvation. Most everybody else's teaches their choice for salvation. So everybody believes in election, I suppose, but they think they're electing God. We think God's electing us. And guess what? They're wrong. Election is God electing us, not we electing him. Uh, Romans eleven, uh, Romans 9 and verse 11. This is speaking of Jacob and Esau when they were still in the womb. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. And it goes on to say that he elected, he chose Jacob and loved Jacob and rejected and hated Esau. And this was when they were in the womb and hadn't done any good or evil. So nobody can say, well, you know, God saw... God saw that Jacob was going to be a good boy and Esau was a bad boy and he chose Jacob. I mean, what part of not uh, haven't done any good or evil don't you understand? Well, that meant just when they were in the womb. No, it didn't. It meant like at the time when he chose them, they hadn't done any good or evil. And when he looks ahead in the tunnel of time, guess what? There's none that do with good, Psalm 14. So they were never going to do any good when God chose Jacob. Verse 16, so then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. You don't elect God. You don't choose God according to your own will to be saved by him. He chooses you if you are saved. But I'll give you one more verse that will cinch this one up. Mark 13 and verse 20. Just in case there's any confusion of who is electing whom, this one should clear it up. Mark 13 and verse 20. This is in the Olivet Discourse. Jesus said, And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sakes, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. And that's all I want is that little phrase there. For the elect's sakes, whom he hath chosen. God chose the elect. The elect didn't choose God. All right? All right, two down, five to go. Predestination is the next term, or predestinate. 
To predestinate is, when you're speaking of God, and that's what we are speaking of here, this is primary definition, it is to foreordain by a divine decree or purpose to salvation or eternal life to elect. So when we talk about predestination, we're talking about election unto salvation, in other words. Predestination, according to the scripture, is God choosing the eternal destination of heaven for his elect before the foundation of the world. Let me give you a couple of verses here. I'm going to read you every verse in the Bible that uses the word predestinate. Don't worry, there's only four. Ephesians 1, actually I already, yeah, yeah, we will. We'll read all four of them. Ephesians 1 and verse 11. You notice that predestinates made up of two words. Pre, or pre is a prefix, but, but two parts there. Pre and destinate. Destinate, like your destination, where you're going, where you're going to end up. Pre means beforehand. See, God beforehand chooses where you are going to end up. For the elect, it's heaven. For the reprobate, it's hell. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Ephesians 1 and verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. This is speaking of our heavenly inheritance, our eternal inheritance, the Bible calls it. In whom we've also obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So we are predestinated to obtain our eternal inheritance. That's our place in the heavenlies. The present heaven right now, if we're to die before Christ comes back. And after Christ comes back, he's going to create a new earth and we have an inheritance on that earth. I'm going to be talking about that for a long time here coming up soon, Lord willing, in the series on heaven, which I'm looking forward to getting to. And then turn with me to Romans 8, 29 through 30. We'll see again that we are predestinated to end up in heaven, which in this verse is called being glorified. That's what happens. When our body is glorified, it happens at the second coming, at the resurrection, when we are ushered into the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, Romans 8, 29 through 30. It says, In whom he did... uh, No, it doesn't say... It says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. It starts off with predestination, foreknowledge and predestination, and it ends in glorification. Glorification is when our bodies are glorified, when when Jesus calls us out of the grave. And we are given a body which is like unto his glorious body, the Bible says. We're glorified. This is God choosing our destination for us. Okay? And predestination is God choosing to make one a child of God by adoption through Jesus Christ before the world began. Look at Ephesians 1 and verse 5. Now I'll talk about what a child of God is here yet this morning. I tried to put this together in in the best order that I could so it kind of makes sense. The problem is, though, you know, when you you read a dictionary, if you just picked up a dictionary and you knew no words in the language, you're going to read the definition of a word and it's going to use a bunch of other words you don't know. And then you've got to look up those other words, right? And it's not like the dictionary can't be written in chronological order where it defines every word, you know, so you know, so every word you read in the dictionary you've already read before... It's just going to work that way. There's just going to be some words in the dictionary that you read that you don't know what mean, and you're going to have to look those up too, right? So in this study, it's kind of like that, where I keep referring to other terms that I haven't got to yet, but I can't get to one before I get to the other. And if I did that, then I, you know, right, vice versa. So I think you get what I'm saying here. By the end of the study, hopefully you'll have all the words in your head, and it'll all make sense. And then maybe you want to pull this outline out and review it, and then it'll all start to click once you have all the terminology correct all sitting out before you, and you can plug it all in. I realize that's wishful thinking for a preacher. But maybe, just maybe, maybe that would happen. Ephesians 1 and verse 5. 
Ephesians 1 and verse 5. I always hear, a pre, you know, I hear preachers, and I've said it too, that you, I'm not going to read this passage, I don't have time, but you can read it tonight on your own clock. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, oh, I doubt it. You know, they got other things to do. But, but anyway, I know how it goes. I've heard sermons like that too, and guess what? I didn't go home and read it either, because I had something else to do, so. Ephesians 1 and verse 5. It says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So here's another thing we're predestinated unto, and that is the adoption of children. We are predestinated to be the children of God, to be adopted by God through Jesus Christ to be God's children. And like I said, we'll talk about what that means to be a child of God here in just a minute. All right, the next one is reprobation or reprobate. Reprobation is theologically, and I, I didn't give you the other definitions because we're looking at it theologically here. Reprobation is rejection by God, the state of being so rejected or cast off and thus ordained to eternal misery, opposed to election in the Calvinistic doctrine of predestination. It says also compare with reprobate the adjective, which we will look at here. So, reprobation is rejection by God. It's the opposite of election. You know, election and rejection. Okay? Reprobate, the adjective, like a per, if you're describing a person, say that guy is a reprobate, or that guy has a reprobate mind, or something like that. Reprobate is rejected or condemned as worthless, inferior, or impure. Impure. Sad to think that God thinks that of some people, but he does. Rejects them as worthless, inferior, and impure. And you know what? Were it not for the grace of Jesus Christ, he'd think that about me and about you, about every one of us, because we are worthless. Actually, we're a lot worse than worthless, because something that's worthless is just, you know, just worthless. We're, we're worse than worthless. We were his enemies. We were at enmity with him. We do evil things and, and really screw this world up and other people's lives and anger God. So we're a lot worse than worthless, as a matter of fact. It also means depraved, degraded, morally corrupt, rejected by God, lost or hardened in sin. Those who are rejected by God and thus excluded from participation in eternal life with him opposed to the elect. Now, the dictionary is correct in saying that reprobation means rejection by God because the Bible defines the term reprobate in that very way in uh, Jeremiah 6 and verse 30. Jeremiah 6 and verse 30. Now, I will qualify something about reprobation here in a minute because there is false views of reprobation out there as well, and I will talk about that just briefly. Uh, Jeremiah 6 and verse 30. It says, Reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. Why do they call them reprobate silver? Because the Lord rejected them. Put it together. What does reprobate mean? Rejected by God. That's what the word means, and that's what the dictionary said too. Reprobate the verb, like if you were going to reprobate somebody, it's to disapprove of, censure, condemn. When you're speaking of God, which is what we're looking at here, it is to reject or cast off a person or persons from himself to exclude from participation in future bliss. Now, reprobation is the action of God choosing before the foundation of the world to reject the people whom he did not choose to save, viewing them as fallen sinners. That is the crucial part there, that last phrase, viewing them as fallen sinners. That's the difference between what is called supralapsarianism and what is called infralapsarianism or sublapsarianism. And I know those are great big words. I've talked about that before. I did a sermon. It was called, I think it was called supralapsarianism. It was something that had supralapsarianism and reprobation in the title of it. I don't remember the exact title right now. But anyway, you can search on the website. You could find that if you wanted to hear it again. 
But the key to it is that when God made this choice to reject some and to save others, he did it viewing them as fallen, not viewing them as unfallen. It's not as if God looked at a perfect, pure human race that had not sinned and they're all in their sinless state like Adam was in the Garden of Eden. And he looks at this whole creation of sinless people and says, "Eh, I'm going to save some, I'm going to damn some. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God chose some and damned some, viewing them as fallen. I, I already gave you a verse. Remember Ephesians 1, 4? It said he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before us and before him in love. When he chose us, we were not holy, which means when he chose us, he was looking at us as unholy, looking at us in the future when we would exist as sinners. He looked at a whole race of sinners and chose to save some and to reject and leave others in their condemned state and to then sentence them to hell because of their sinful state. You don't want to fall into the camp where God looks at people that haven't sinned and just says, I'm going to send him to hell just because I want to send some people to hell. If I understand right, that was Calvin's position, basically. God determined from the very beginning, before he ever created anybody, I want to have some in heaven and some in hell. And and he did that. That's not true. That is not true. God did it with viewing them as already fallen. Now, the reprobate are those sinners whom God rejected who are not in Christ and he is not in them. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 13. And verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. Paul says here, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves, Know ye not that your own self, know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Christ is in you, except if you're a reprobate. If you're a reprobate, he's not in you, and you're not in him, because that means you've been rejected by God. And that's why Paul tells us to examine ourselves and prove ourselves. Prove your own works, prove your own faith. Make it, make yourself assured that you're in Christ and that you're not a reprobate. Because I certainly don't want to be a reprobate, I can tell you that much. Reprobates are identified by their reprobate thoughts and behavior, reprobate being depraved or morally corrupt. I'll just give you a few verses here. In Romans 1 and verse 28, this is what identifies a reprobate, is his depraved and corrupt thoughts and behavior. Romans 1 and verse 28, even at, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. See, God will give sinners over to a reprobate mind. It's already within their nature. It says, surely in, in Psalm 76, 10, surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, the remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. It's already in their nature. All God has to do is give them over to it. Just lift up the restraints and just let them do everything that's in their corrupt nature. And they will do all those things that are listed in the end of Romans chapter 1. If he gives them over to it. He doesn't make them do it. He just gives them over to it. He allows them to do what they want to do. Like it says in Proverbs 1, then shall they eat of the fruit of their own ways and be filled with their own devices. God just says, all right, you want it? Go ahead, do it. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 8. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 8. Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, those are Pharaoh's magicians, that did the counterfeit miracles when Moses was trying to show Pharaoh that God had sent him. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Reprobate. You find people that withstand the man that God has sent and resist the truth 
that he's preaching, you found somebody that's of a reprobate mind. And one more, Titus 1 and verse 16. Titus 1, 16. <clears throat> they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. So those are the characteristics of people that are reprobates. So when you think reprobate, just think not elect. That's what a reprobate is. A reprobate is somebody who is not elect, not chosen by God for salvation, but chosen by God for damnation because of their sin. All right, let's get to the next one. Child of God. A child of God is an elect, born-again person who has eternal life. We'll get to eternal life later in this study. We have talked about elect already. We'll get to born again after this term. So a child of God is an elect, born-again person who has eternal life. Let me just give you a few verses here. In uh, Luke 20 and verse 36, this phrase or a variation of it is used a number of times in Scripture. This is a term that I use frequently. When I refer to somebody who is a saved person, I refer to him as a child of God. That's probably my go-to term that I use when I refer to somebody who is one of the elect, a child of God. Uh, Luke 20 and verse 36. Jesus said, Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of of the resurrection. This is referring to people, you know, to the saints who are already resurrected and glorified, and they're called the children of God. Now, a person becomes a child of God before the resurrection, but they are children of God in the resurrection as well, being children of the resurrection. Uh, look at Romans eight fourteen through sixteen. Romans eight fourteen through sixteen. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, which would be a synonym for children of God. For ye have not, uh, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, because he's our Father, we're his children, right? The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Right, a child of God is a son of God who has been given the Spirit of God. He's regenerated, in other words. He's born again. And we'll get to that term next. Remember Ephesians 1 and verse 5, that he hath um, predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. That's how we became a child of God. We were adopted by God to become his child. Look at uh, Galatians 4, 4 through 6. Galatians 4, 4 through 6. It says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So a son of God is a person that has the Spirit of God. He's born again, in other words. And let me give you one more. In 1 John 3, and verses 1 and 2. 1 John 3, 1 and 2. First John 3, 1 and 2. Behold... What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God, or children of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So a child of God is an elect, born-again person that has eternal life. A child of God is a spiritual child by new birth, not a natural child by natural birth. Let's look at Romans 9 and verse 8. If you're a child of God, it's because you had a spiritual birth that made you God's child. Not because you were born to 
certain people of a certain ethnicity or religion, like the Jews, right? When if, if a Jew in Jesus' day was born to a Jew, if you were a child born to a Jew, that did not automatically make you a child of God. It is not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man. You have to be born of the Spirit. Being born of the flesh does not make you God's child. Being born to Christian parents does not make you a child of God. I like the saying that I learned from an old Presbyterian one time, that God has no grandchildren. God only has children. Just because God has children doesn't mean their children are going to, get, going to be God's children. God doesn't have grandchildren. God only has children. Romans 9 and verse 8. And I think some people, I mean, people get this idea that, <clears throat> that if I'm elect, then my children are going to be elect. And then if the children don't end up following in the faith, and then their, their faith is overthrown, or at least they're confused because, well, wait a minute, if I'm elect, my children are elect, but my child's certainly not acting like one of the elect, maybe I'm not elect, right? I mean, you see where that, that line of thinking can go. Was, was Isaac elect? He was. Was his son Esau elect? No, he was not. You just do the best you can training up your children, and if they're God's children, then let him draw them unto himself and bring them to repentance. And if he does or he doesn't, that's up to him. Romans 9 and verse 8. It says, That is, they which are the children of the flesh... These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Paul here is talking about how not all they that are of Israel are the, not all, uh, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Everybody that was born in the Jewish nation was not necessarily part of the Israel of God. That's what he's saying here. The, they that were born after the flesh, they're not the children of God. It's the children of the promise. It's the elect within the nation. They're the children of God. It was that way in Israel, and it's that way in every nation. A child of God is one of the elect who is born again, quickened, regenerated, and in possession of eternal salvation, but not necessarily converted or a Christian. Okay? Let me say it again. A child of God is one of the elect who is born again, which we'll get to next, quickened, which we'll get to after that, regenerated, which we'll get to in a future study, and in possession of eternal salvation, which we'll get to later in another study, but not necessarily converted, which we'll get to in another study, or a Christian, which we got to in the first study. You see? It's all over the place. Every child of God is elect. Every child of God is born again. Every child of God is quickened. Every child of God is regenerated. Every child of God is in possession of eternal salvation. But not every child of God is converted, and not every child of God is a Christian. And we'll get to what it means to be converted, like I said, in a future study. That's why I use, when I'm referring to one of the elect, I use the word child of God. I don't use the word believer or you know, something like that, because I don't, want to, I don't want to get confused. I want to be very precise in what I'm talking about here. All right, born again. Born again, I'm going to give you the dictionary definition, and it's not really all that valuable. Uh, this is one of those cases where it's been affected by evangelicalism and things like that. But I will give you the dictionary definition after I get a drink of water. Oh, God gave me the spirit to be a preacher, but not the voice. <clears throat> But he's given me enough, so I just have to do the best with what I can. Because so my voice does get weak, as you can probably hear right now. Born again is of, pertaining to, or characterized by an experience of new birth in Christ or spiritual renewal. Of a Christian, it's placing special emphasis on this experience as a basis for all one's actions evangelical. Figuratively, it's regenerate revitalized, characterized by the extreme enthusiasm of the newly converted or reconverted. 
Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so new birth in Christ is good. Spiritual renewal is good. And regenerate is good. Revitalize, possibly. You pretty much chuck the rest of that definition because all that stuff is sensationalism. If you're born again, you're all excited and you're all, you know, and this this euphoria and all this stuff. And that is not what it is to be born again. Not at all. The dictionary definition of born again is only partly accurate. Uh, being born again is the state of a person whom God has regenerated, which is to be quickened, given him a new spirit and eternal life, making him a child of God. That's what it is to be born again. Let me give you a few verses here. In John 3, 3 through 8. John 3, 3 through 8. Yeah, read through the Bible, and there's not very many places where the word born again, phrase born again is used. Um, as a matter of fact, it may just be in John 3. I'd have to, I'd have to think about that. But when you, when you search this phrase, you're not going to find the common evangelical idea of being born again. <clears throat> being born again is not synonymous with conversion. Okay, It's not an, an experience that you go through in life, like an emotional experience. Uh, that could be a result of being born again, but that's not what it is to be born again. John 3, 3 through 8. Jesus answered and said unto him, this is to the, the Pharisee Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man that is born, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, which means where it wants to. The wind bloweth where it listeth, <clears throat> and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. People talk about the day that they were born again, like they know the exact day. Well, that's funny, because Jesus said, everyone is born of the Spirit is like the wind that blows where it listeth. Right? You don't control where the wind blows, when the wind blows. The only thing you can see is the effect of the wind blowing. That's it. Right? You can't pinpoint the day you were born again. At least, I don't think very many people can anyway. It is that, it is that, that point at which you are given a new spirit. Just like when you're born the first time. It's when you were, you were given life. As a matter of fact, when you were born, you weren't given life because you actually were given it you know, nine months prior. But you get the point, right? When you became a child of your parents, which was technically at conception, that's the point in which you were given physical life. Okay? When you're born again, it's the point at which you're given spiritual life by God, your Father. Remember Titus 3 and verse 5, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. This is what this is referring to here. Being born of the Spirit is being regenerated by the Spirit. We'll get to regenerated later, like I said. This is also called being begotten again, which is a, a synonym. 1 Peter 1 and verse 23. 1 Peter 1 and verse 23. Oh, there, I was wrong. Born again is used again here in 1 Peter. Okay. 1 Peter 1, 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I was begotten again is coming later. I'm, I was uh, thinking of a different verse. Being born again by the word of God. Now, there's a lot of Arminian preachers out there, and I got into a big argument with one at a pastor's conference one time. I wasn't trying to get into an argument with him. I was just simply trying to show him something very kindly and gently. And boy, when he knew what I was, when he realized what I was saying, he started flipping out and said, there's no salvation outside the word of God. There's no salvation outside the word of God. I mean, he was just going crazy. And um, that was pretty much the end of that conversation. But <clears throat> anyway... Being born again 
by the word of God is not talking about the scriptures. Okay? Jesus Christ is also called the word of God. Now, Jesus Christ is not the scriptures. Jesus Christ is not the Bible. Jesus Christ is the word made flesh. The word is the second person of the Trinity. Okay, When Jesus is called the word of God, it's referring to the second person of the Trinity. He's not the Bible. He's not the word of God. He is not paper and ink. He is a person called the word of God. This is what this verse is talking about. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Jesus Christ lives and abides forever. Let me give you one more verse. And that's, and I will just compare this, and I'll show you that this verse is talking about Jesus Christ being born again by the word of God. I'll show you what word of God you're born again by. You're born again by the person of the word of God, by the word coming out of his mouth, his actual voice, by the power coming out of him, not the Bible, his voice. That's how you're born again. John 5 and verse 25. John 5 and verse 25. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Not, he didn't say the word of God. He said the voice of the Son of God. He's not talking about them hearing the gospel preached by somebody. He's talking about them hearing his actual voice. Now you say, well, I don't remember hearing his actual voice. You know why you don't remember hearing his voice when you were born again? Because you were dead when he did it. You were spiritually dead and you're not going to hear the voice. Just like Lazarus, when he was lying in the grave, he was dead physically. When Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, if you would have asked Lazarus five minutes later, hey, do you remember what Jesus said to you? No, nope. he was dead. His voice or his body responded to the sovereign call of Jesus Christ, just like nothing responded to the call when God said, let there be light. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When God called the heavens and the earth into existence, they came. They didn't hear his voice with their ears. They obeyed his voice because his voice is his sovereign will being acted out. This is what this is referring to. Jesus Christ sovereignly commanding a sinner that is dead in trespasses and sins to come to life spiritually, just like he did to Lazarus physically. This is not the spoken word of God by a preacher. This is not the Bible. This is the sovereign voice of Jesus Christ. That's what Peter was talking about when he said you're, you're born again by the word of God, by Jesus Christ and his sovereign command to give you new life. So being born again is a synonym of being a child of God, being quickened and being regenerated. So anytime you hear those four terms, it's referring to the same thing. Child of God, quickened, which I'll get to here in just a second, um, and being regenerated. Those four things, born again, child of God, quickened and regenerated, all mean the same thing. Being born again is not synonymous with conversion or with being a Christian, but it rather happens prior to conversion and becoming a Christian. Let me give you a verse. Actually, if you're still there in John 5, just go up one verse to verse 24. John 5, 24. I'm going to show you here that being born again, being quick and being regenerated comes prior to believing the gospel and being converted. John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. The person that hears and believes presently, that's old English there for present tense. Heareth and believeth, believeth is in the present tense. <clears throat> he hath everlasting life. That's also in the present tense. If you hear and believe, you already have eternal life. 
But when did you get eternal life? That's the real question. That's the last part of the verse. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Is passed is present perfect tense, which means that it happened in the past and its effects continue on into the present. So when you put that together, he that hears and believes, which is the process by which conversion happens, and we'll get to conversion, like I said, later. He that hears and believes is passed from death into life. In other words, you have to be passed from death into life, which is to be regenerate, to be born again, to be a child of God, to be quickened. You have to have passed from death into life before you can hear and believe. And for good reason. Because before you pass from death into life, you were what? Dead. And if you're dead, you can't hear and believe anything, can you? The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Let me give you one more. 1 John 5 and verse 1. 1 John 5 and verse 1. <clears throat> Similar sentence construction here. Not exactly, but similar. 1 John 5 and verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him that is begotten of him. Whosoever believeth, that's present tense, that Jesus is the Christ, is born. Is born is not the present perfect tense. It is the... Um, no, I can't, I can't think of the, the technical term for it anyway. But it's, a, it's an accomplished fact already, right? If you believe, you are born. L let me just, let me give you something that will help you out. Because I can't think of the verb, the verb tense there. First um, John 2 and verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Let me ask you a question. Does doing righteousness make you to be born of him, get you to be born of him, or are you born of him and then you do righteousness? In this verse. Everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. If you do righteousness, you're already born of him. You're doing righteousness because you're born of him, right? Let's look at another one. Uh, John, let's see, it's, um, where is it? Four. It is... Where is it? Is it for? Just a minute here. I'll find it. Three seven. Three seven. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. If you do righteousness, it's because you are righteous. You don't do righteousness to get righteous. Christ made you righteous, therefore you can do righteousness. And then the one I was thinking of is four seven. First John four seven. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Is this verse teaching that you get to be born of God by loving? No. This verse is saying that if you love, you are born of God. Being born of God comes first. That's why and how you can love. If you're born of God, you will love. If you're born of God, you will do righteousness. If you're born of God, or I could say you can. If you're born of God, you have the ability to love. If you have the ability, if you have, if you're born of God, you have the ability to do righteousness. And if you are born of God, you have the ability to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And if you believe that, you are born of God. It doesn't get you to the point of being born of God. So, being born again is not synonymous with conversion. It comes prior to conversion. And let me just do one more here and we'll be done. I would have quit a little while ago, but the next section I, I got some that I want to get together into one sermon because they deal with each other and things like that. So I kind of pushed through. And this is the word quicken. This will be the last one. Quicken is to give or restore life to, to make alive, to vivify or revive, to animate as the soul, the body. To quicken is to make alive. Quick means life. You ever heard the saying, cut to the quick, right? The quick in the dead, right? Talking about life. Well, to quicken is to give or restore life to. To quicken is to make alive and resurrect spiritually. 
Turn to John 5 and verse 21. John 5 and verse 21. John 5, 21. For, for as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, so therefore, right, right, right there in that verse, it pretty much defines what it is to quicken, to raise up the dead, right? Even so will the Son quicken whom he will. The Son will raise from the dead whom he will. To quicken is to raise from the dead. Now, we know we have body, soul, and spirit. Our soul and spirit are dead in sins. Our body will be dead someday. Jesus Christ resurrects our soul and spirit by the power of his voice, and that's called a quickening. And then he will also quicken us out of the grave. He will raise our bodies from the dead. He quickens whom he will. See, there's sovereign grace for you again. Jesus Christ doesn't quicken who, who wants to be quickened. He quickens whom he will. He chooses who he quickens. You remember John 5.25, just let me read it to you again. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. This is not talking about the resurrection of the body, because he said the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. The resurrection of the body is in verses 28 and 29, when he says, All that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and they shall come forth. Right? That's the resurrection of the body. Verse 25 is the resurrection of the inward man, the soul and the spirit. It was happening at that very moment. It's been happening since the dawn of time. Isaac, we are told, was born of the spirit. He was born by, by the power of the voice of God himself, calling him from death unto life. Ephesians 2, 1 and 5. Use this word quicken again. Ephesians 2, 1 and 5. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved. You see how these, these things get tied together. Quickening is the means by which God saves by grace. God dis determines to show mercy and kindness towards somebody, and he does so by changing their nature, by Christ paying for their sins first of all, and then by him giving them a new spiritual nature, a new spirit within, that is, salvation by grace. And he does so when the sinner is dead. Turn with me to 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. It's got two more verses. First Peter 1 Peter 1.3, this is the one that I mistakenly thought I was taking you to a minute ago. This process of quickening is also called being begotten again. 1 Peter 1 and verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Begotten us again is a synonym of being born again, which is a synonym of being quickened. That's why it says there that you're quickened with, you were, um, quickened with Christ. In another verse, we are begotten again by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. His resurrection guarantees ours. Our spiritual resurrection first, our physical resurrection second. And, lastly, for the last verse anyway, quickening happens when a person has been legally justified by Christ's death on the cross. It happens after that. Colossians 2 and verse 13. I may talk about the five phases of salvation in this series too. That's something that I haven't preached on for a long time. And I think it, I may do a... I may cover that. And so we'll, we'll get... A little more information here on where the phases all, how the phases all fit together. But for now, we'll just see that quickening happens after justification. Colossians 2.13 says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. I wanted verse 14, I think. I wanted verse 14. Or did I? I wanted chapter 2. 
13. I knew that didn't look right. 2.13. Maybe this will be better. Two third, Colossians 2.13 And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses. Now you got to examine the grammar here a little bit. And you being dead in your sins so at the time when you were quickened you were dead or in your sins so clearly you didn't have anything to do with this process since you were dead hath quickened together with him, that is with Christ, having forgiven you all trespasses. The forgiving you of all trespasses comes before the quickening because he quickened you having forgiven all trespasses. Okay, so the the forgiveness of the trespasses comes first. That's justification. And then the quickening comes after that. You were forgiven your trespasses when Christ died for the for your sins on the cross. Right? That was long time before you were born. You're quickened at some point in your physical mortal life, given eternal life, sometime when you're already born into this world. So the forgiveness of sins comes first, then the quickening, then the being born, the born again, quickening, regeneration, all meaning the same thing. So being quickened is a synonym of regeneration. It's also a synonym of being born again. It's a synonym of being a child of God. Quickening is not a synonym of conversion, but rather it happens prior to conversion. Okay, so I'm trying to get all these terms straight in your mind because it is important. When you start throwing these words around, if you start using them incorrectly and and using born again in place of of belief or being converted or something like that, then you're going to start confusing people and that's what I'm trying to help you to avoid. So next time we'll pick it up and we're going to talk about justification. And there are two different types of justification in the Bible and we don't want to get those confused either because that is another very important thing. So anyway, we will pick it up next week, Lord willing.